Hi, everybody, and welcome to Open Source Tonight. Hope you're enjoying our broadcast here that I literally just started. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to get right into the meat of our discussion in just a few seconds. I'm just going to make sure that we are actually transmitting to the world like I think we are, because that would be pretty embarrassing if we weren't on the air and I'm sitting here talking to myself. I've done that. <laughs> I've done that, okay? I've, I've sat here and been like, oh, yeah, we're on the air. No, we're not. So if you don't want that to happen again, right? We want to avoid stuff like that happening twice. So let's just make sure that we're on the air by checking out what YouTube has to say. And it does say something's on the air. All right. So I think we're really on the air. Yep. It says that we have an excellent connection. So let's get the party started then. So feel free to chat with me in the chat room periodically as you feel interested. My apologies in advance for the slightly annoying sound in the background. That is there for a very simple reason called it is cold in East Kentucky. I did not want my heating off during this broadcast for obvious reasons. So I chose to not have it off for obvious reasons. But because of this, you will hear it in the background potentially a tiny bit. Uh, when I was listening to the mix I was testing out before I went to air, it seemed like it was mostly tolerable and minimally noticed. But if for some reason you do notice, well, sorry. But anyway, let's get started. So I've got a fresh virtual machine of the Engine X VM stuffs. The in, what's it called? Engine X. Uh, and so if I launch that VM real quick here, and we just switch over to said VM. Oh, it's trying to crash. Okay. Of course, this VM works perfectly till we try. What's your problem? Okay, I know what the problem is. Hold on. It it it. It's decided that it's upset with USB 2.0 for some reason. We don't need USB 2.0 for this VM. All right. But so if we look at my screen, you can see it right here. We've got a high-quality Nginx uh, setup here. Can we make this 100? Yeah, we can. So 175% zoom. So this is what we're looking at for the duration of the show. I'm going to log in. Okay, and so I'm logged in, and what we're going to do, okay, is we're actually going to come in here, and we are actually going to come in here, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually set everything up. I know, what a crazy idea, but that's what we're going to do. So first things first, that's going to make my mic sound horrible right there, isn't it? Let me just move my mic a little farther away from the keyboard. So let's just do an apt update. Now this is a fresh VM, and what do you know? We're already up to date. So now what I want to do is I'm going to do an apt install engine X and lib engine X. Hold on. Well, is it not? I may have to double check what this is. Sure, list every. Well, <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. Okay, I'm trying to remember what it was. It's like lib engine and uh, I'm spelling engine X wrong there. There we go. Mod and then RTMP. So I'm going to set this up to do some live streaming as uh, and we're going to just do this on there. I did a video that was kind of short about this. But that's not the only thing I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be showing a little bit of everything here today web related, but we've got our server installed. So if I actually look at the IP address and it's 192.168.106, which is the same IP it was the last time that I tested this, because I did this last night as well. We can bring over our Firefox, and what do you know? Right there it is. Welcome to Nginx on that IP. So that's pretty cool, right? We literally, just like that, have an Nginx config that's going to serve web pages for us. Now, we actually want to do some media streaming, though, and that's where it gets interesting. So... What I want to do next, because I'm not really a huge fan of not copy and pasting big config files, what we're going to actually do now is I'm actually going to SSH into this VM, which I already set up with SSH. Okay. So that's what we're going to do now, is I'm going to just SSH into it. Hold on, let me get my terminal up here for you. Okay, SSH, and we're going to do... We're going to just log into it real quick. Okay. So if we switch back over here, you can see it's asking me, you know, to log in. And we're logged in. Welcome to Debian. 
you notice I called it streaming dash server dash test for the host name. So what we're gonna do, we want to edit etc. nginx nginx.conf. Oh, I forgot we don't have. Uh, I'm used to Ubuntu, so let me do. No, I was gonna do sudo like that. Sudo su. And we'll switch over to root, and now we can do the same stuff. So nginx and then nginx.conf. And here it is. So again, I made the font big so people can see on screens that are low resolution, or maybe you're watching this in low resolution because your internet's not that good. I've been there, guys, I tell you. We're gonna put in a directive called RTMP here. But what I'm gonna actually do is I'm gonna actually pull up a guide that I like to use as a base, and it's, I got a hair in my mouth. Okay, this is what happens when you're watching live, people. You get to see all the bloopers. Anyway, but this is an article right here that I like to reference when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's from the um, Digital Ocean folks, okay? Now, we're going to, for the most part, not be using this because I do most of it by hand. But this part right here, I don't have to type. So we don't have to. I'm just going to paste it in right here. And at the most basic level, we're done. But I do want to turn on some HLS stuff so we can live stream to it that way. So I'm going to do HLS on and then I'm going to do HLS underscore nested. I'm going to turn that on and actually here we'll do HLS underscore path and then I'm going to do slash var slash www slash HTML H well HTML slash HLS and this is a very low end streaming uh, instance, if you will. So just so everybody knows the specs of this VM, we're talking about one gig of RAM and one core of CPU power. So you could run this in a DigitalOcean instance very easy, for example, uh, or some other virtual machine instance, uh, you know, some VPS hosting in a data center environment. So if you need to do that. So let's do that. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to actually go ahead now and I am going to create that directory we just created. So I'm going to do, if I can type, make dir, and then I'm gonna do, with autocomplete, create that directory. And so now if we list, if we list the structure or list the storage or whatever you wanna call it, slash var, there it is. Now, that is simple enough, right? We've got something that's working, but like, what do we do now? Well, first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to restart the server because I forgot to do that almost. So we're going to do system CTL. Actually, before we even do that, let me show you another thing here. So to test your config is right. Mine should be, but let's double check. You can do nginx-t in your terminal. And as you can see, the config file test was successful. So we should be able to safely restart nginx. It will restart without issues. If you miss like a semicolon or something, you can have a problem. So I've just restarted nginx. And now we can actually just do a status check of it, and we're on the, the air, so to speak, right? We have got our Nginx good to go. So because we've got it good to go, what's the next step for us? Well, the next step is let's actually encode something to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring over our good friend OBS Studio. So I'm going to open it up here, and I'm going to not show my screen for a second so I can clear the key that's currently in it out for good reason. You know, good security and all. Okay, so I see there's actually uh, not... All right, there we go. So I'm going to actually be able to show you this now. So if we look over at my computer screen, here it is. This is it, okay? This is it right here. I have got my encoder. So let's point it to 192.168.106. Now, of course, in your case, it's going to be different. Now. Right now, we don't have a stream key. I'll show how to set that up possibly another time, but there is a way to do it. You need to write like a little bit of PHP or Python or something that can look at the key and see if it's right. So this is a video that me and my friend Billy shot a while back, and you know it's a whole edited thing, and we're just streaming it through OBS. So if I hit the Start Streaming button here, as you can see, disconnect, reconnection successful. Why is it auto disconnecting? Hold on, let's take a look. 106. Yeah, that should be right. Oh, I know what it is. I forgot a line, everybody. This is something I forgot about. So we need to actually allow 
the right IP. And their example is localhost. In my case, we don't want localhost. We want we want my desktop static IP. We'll restart Nginx. And now let's hit streaming. And just like that, we are on the air with that stream. Now, if we actually come back here and we look at, we'll give it a second here, the directory we set up for HLS, we should have an HLS feed generating, and there it is. So we can actually take that and stream with it. So it's really very easy. HLS has the advantage that it works on almost everything. And of course it works on Apple devices because if you didn't catch the full name, it's Apple HLS. So let's actually go, I will show you here real quick how to do this. This is how we stream our feed. See, we literally can do this. Now you don't have to use VLC, but that's what I'm gonna use for now. And 106, hold on, let me double check I got that right, yeah. So index dot, do I have a typo? Hold on. Uh, okay. M3U8. Yeah, I think that's that should be right. So we may not... Usually it plays a VLC, but, you know, I'm doing a live show here, so it doesn't want to. Now, there's another way to show how to play it, and I actually wanted to show this anyway, and it is actually how to play it with a um, with a web page. So let's do that. So I'm going to create a file called player.html. And now I'm going to copy some boilerplate here. Hold on a minute. From this project called hls.js. You can see I've already been to this site before. And so what I want to do here is I'm actually going to come down and I'm going to find, and this is open source, by the way, if you hadn't guessed. I mean, it's on GitHub. So, But this right here, what it does is it will allow you to use Apple HLS on browsers like Firefox that don't natively support it, Google Chrome, etc. Uh, on desktop and so we can actually place our stream right here because we're putting this in the same directory I can literally just do index dot like that and let me just double check yeah okay so we have our HLS so if I actually come back here let's do it let's go slash HLS slash player dot HTML and there's our stream. So if I hit play, I'm streaming a really low bit rate, even though I don't know why. It's literally on the local network. So, you know, why don't we adjust the bit rate here? But you can see this is playing in Firefox. And if we come back, there is a slight delay of HLS. So it's not quite real time, but it's close. It's, you know, it's just a few seconds off, you know, like you would do YouTube or something. So let me go. Here it is. So let's say we're going to, let's do, Let's do, let's see, what is that? That should be, I believe my math's right, 10 megs a second about. We'll restart and that will look a lot better. Now, we'll give it a second, I'm gonna refresh. We gotta wait for that stream to recreate and it takes several seconds. So, as you can see here, it basically is constantly updating this. So, if I hit play, do we have, yeah, it still doesn't look good, that's weird, so. It should be updating the, there it goes. It was just getting a little bit of the end and this is something that you can have happen. So there you go. You can look at that. And if I was to say full screen this, that looks really good. I mean, that looks almost identical to the actual feed we're sending out as far as from OBS with that bit rate. It looks great. That right there will natively play on iPhones, iPad, etc. Okay, it will. And... Um, you know, so this is just a simple little thing. You could customize this. I've been looking into doing some live streaming stuff lately, and this is something that has been looked into by me, um, is the ability to do this. So this is something I want to eventually host my own live stream. Now, um, in addition to YouTube, I think that would be a cool idea, though I don't know if I can afford it because bandwidth gets expensive quickly. So I don't know if I'm actually going to do it, but if you want to do it, let me show you. That right there will get your streaming set up, right, at the most basic level. Now, that would be on the same server you need to set up cores if you want it to work on other sites which we can look at in a minute but what I want to show right now is another thing if you want to push to say something like YouTube you can so I'm actually going to show how to do that too so if we open up our engine x.conf configuration again so 
Sorry about my mic there. But if we actually do that again, okay, we can do some pretty cool stuff here. With the push directive, and then we give it a URL. So in our case, RTMP colon slash slash. So I think it's RTMPS for YouTube, isn't it? And it's going to be a dot YouTube. This is the one for YouTube, by the way. Live to slash, and then your key goes here. So key here. And if I was to start streaming to that again, just like that, we would have a live stream that goes to our website and to YouTube at the same time. So you could set that up in a data center and you could have a lot of really interesting fun with it, actually. I think it would be a really fun idea to actually be able to do that. So it might be something for you all to investigate in the future if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But we can do some other things with Nginx as well. So let me show you that now because I just want to keep the fun train going. So let's transition back over here to the computer. I'm actually going to do an apt install of something else. It's going to be php-fpm, right? And I believe this is the package we want. Let me double check with the Nginx config. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up PHP to work with Nginx. So let's just see. Uh, Actually, I forgot we need to look in the sites enabled for this. So you can have multiple sites on this, just like you can say Apache with different domain names and all serve separately. And the way you do that is you set server name right here. Instead of that underscore, you would just set that instead to um, your domain name. I'm going to add index.php to this real quick. Awesome. And then we're going to come in here, and you see right here, so 7.4 is the right version. All right, that answered my question. So we're going to just enable this real quick. So you just uncomment those lines. And like I said, I've learned from experience how to do this. And now we've got PHP almost ready. But here's what we need to do now. We need to do an apt install PHP. And this is on Debian, by the way, just so everybody knows. And I'm going to go ahead and run this and install it. And here we go. Ubuntu is pretty similar to this, which is what I usually do it on. But today I thought we'd do some stuff on Debian because it's been a little while since I've used a lot of Debian. Did last night, but it, you know, other than that, it's been, well, I use Debian on the Pi all the time, actually, so I guess that's not true. But anyway, now we've got something that should be able to serve PHP. So here's what I want to do. Slash var www html, and let's just call it test.php. And this right here will prove that we have PHP support. I think, what is it? It's like, I think it's is it PHP info we can look at? I know I could just print PHP info. I just want to make sure here that I'm using the right thing. Um, let's see here. Yep, PHP info. So I'm going to just, I thought that's all I had to do. So let's just run over to our address. Well. So over here, we've got our site. And if I switch to test.php, it downloads. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? My brain goes 100 miles an hour. Sometimes I forget to do this stuff. I forgot to restart the server, Nginx, which is a requirement. So we're going to restart Nginx. Oh, we have, what did I forget? I probably forgot a semicolon or something to comment. Oh, it's mad at me about that URL. So let me, because that's a fake one, and it's like all upset. So hold on. Let's just go in here and just fix it. So we'll just search for RTMP. And here's our push. Maybe maybe it can't be HTTPS. I forget. I did this last night, and it, it worked. I actually did it for real stream. But anyway, I think it's probably upset because it's capitals or something. Maybe that's what it is. Regardless, now it's happy if I comment that out. So let's restart Nginx again. Now, if we refresh the page and I do test.php, this is our PHP info. So as you can see, just like that, we are running PHP scripts on our high quality uh, web server, which I think is pretty cool, right? Isn't that cool? Um, 
And so, yeah, I think that's that's pretty cool. So we've got a site right here that works. And I mean, we can look at our configuration of the site if we want. But realistically, like as you can see, everything works just fine. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, so I mean, what can I say? It's a pretty interesting thing. Now, I do want to show one more thing here real quick about my websites. Uh, and that is actually, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the back end of VincentMaggard.com. Okay. That's what I'm about to do is I'm going to do that. Now, I use a little tool here. Hold on. And I'm going to show you it. It is called Hugo. And I think you all will find it quite interesting. It's become very popular in the open source world in the recent past. But here is the website right here. So Hugo is a static site generator and it's really cool. You know, you could build custom themes as I've done or you can do uh, all these different things. And this is a showcase of some of the websites that was built on it. And I mean, as you can see, this is a great architecture, right? Very great. Even the US government uses it. So I wanted to show how it works. So if I do Hugo, and then what is it? Serve, Hugo server, here we go. I've got a web address right here. And if we actually was to look, there's my website, guys. Look at that. But here's the difference. This is all being hosted locally. And I've got a great architecture. So if I look at like VS Code, for example, type code, come on. Okay. I need to get better lighting over my keyboard because half the time I type stuff wrong. But anyway, here's VS Code. And we can look at the site. So for example, I could come in here. Actually, this is not updated. We could do a git pull. Okay, now it's updated. But if we could do a git pull, and then we can look at everything. So for example, here's the theming. I'll show you some of the theming. So like the videos page, for example. Let's go to here. So I should probably make this font a little bigger. Let's see here. What is the command to do that in VS Code? I forget. It is view, I think. Let's just do it from the menu. Um, maybe it's just like Control Plus or something. Like I remember. There, it's Control Plus. Okay. So this is a little bit better. But you can see here. And by the way, this style actually isn't necessary for this page. This is for some stuff that I was testing all back that isn't even on this page. But anyway, this iframe is YouTube. Now, you might notice something about this. It passes in a video ID parameter. Now, the reason it does that is because that's how I want this to work. And there's other parameters here on the page, too, as you can see. So if we look at how one of these videos actually works up here in content and, let's say, videos, I can just click on one. So new camera, new film. This is a video I posted last year. And if you notice something, we have a video ID. This right here, if we go to it, is what gets substituted in that iframe. And that will pull up the video player from YouTube of said video. The description I copy and paste from YouTube as well, modifying it occasionally to a certain level. There's also a link section on some videos. Let me see if I can find it. So hold on. This is the way I used to do it, by the way. Some of the pages need to be updated. But most of them, it's fully automated. Where is the one? I don't put links on every page. And the ones I do, some of them look like that. Here it is. So this is an example of a video where I started putting in the links like this. So this auto-generates for me. And it makes it really easy for me to update the site. So I literally just run Hugo. It generates the static pages. And then I can use Secure FTP or secure copy or whatever to my server that I use for hosting. And then you can see right there, you're good to go. Now in my case, I'm using a shared host and they give me SFTP access. So that's what I use. And so that's all we need, everybody, is we simply right here create a template. So I can make another video super easy. And if we come back to the site and I go to videos, oh, I forgot. We need Hugo running. So if I come back to videos, New camera, new film, right here's the page. And if we view source on it, which it's actually being minified because I set it to do that, but if we find the URL, hold on. 
Let's see here. YouTube right here. This is our YouTube link. See that right there? That video ID is substituted right in from up here. So in our case, it's this video that you're seeing the page for. So if we went and looked at, say, another page and we say, well, actually, we could just look at this one. If I was to go in here and I say, uh, this is true, obviously, I'm not going to publish this to the site. But now if I was to do that and I come over to videos, I may have to reload the server. Hmm. Strange. Let me just try removing public. So hold on. Why is okay? So we'll remove public with recursive. For some reason, I I think I have to serve from memory. There's a command to do it, and that usually refreshes a little easier. But well, okay, maybe drafts. Let's see, draft true. That's weird, because usually it doesn't, when it's a draft, it doesn't show up there, but now it is. Did they change something in Hugo? Or am I just confused? Who knows? Um, but anyway, like normally if you like add a new one, maybe I should show doing that. Then you'll have a new one. So let's say I went and added, it's like this, Hugo, and then new, and then content, and then I'll do videos, and then I'll do an ID of test.md. For a marked directory, a marked on file. Restart the server, and now if we scroll around here, we have a blank one. Now it automatically created the title test. Oh, huh? It didn't use the architect. So the architect up here. This is. I normally do this on Windows, and today I'm actually doing it on Linux, and I think that might be messing me up. Um, I'm thinking what's probably going on is that uh, this system might put the latest version of Hugo on it to show this, and I bet that's what it is, because I don't let me update it from this box usually. Anyway, but this is what it's supposed to do, is it will actually take those values. My guess is is that they've updated Hugo and, and the architectures work a little different. But anyway, regardless, like the actual site, the way it publishes works fine. I'm not really sure why the architectures aren't working, but anyway, if it, you know, if we do that, it works fine, but Regardless, like all the pages work, so I can go to short films and you know, this is all being customized. So like the footer down here, if we get rid of content here and we look at our partials, I have a footer. Okay. And you can see we have our sister sites, we have everything here that you see down here. So that gets placed into the template very easily. So for example, if we look at index, you can see here, where is it? Index. Dot, yeah, here it is. Here's our footer. See, we do our parcel and we do a parcel for the head too. And this is what our head looks like. At least right now, I'm probably going to change it, but you know, because uh, it's you know it's my site and I'm constantly kind of tweaking it and improving it, but it gives me a very nice site and I really like it. I did my own custom theme for it. You know it's pretty cool. And I mean again the fact that Hugo is open source, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, you know I mean again this is very free. So like if we go to Quick Start here, you need to install Hugo and you know again you want Git because you can do your site. You can do Hugo new site, and then you can put Git in there. And anyway, so I mean, like you can do, you know, I use Git to manage the site's contents. And so, you know, you can do that. You can do here the different Hugo settings. There's a configuration file. Anyway, regardless, like you can get some really powerful, powerful stuff with this architecture. And I find it's kind of interesting. So if you all have any questions about it, I you know, do see some people are watching the live show. I appreciate your viewership, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. If you got any questions about any of this stuff, I've been using Hugo for over a year now. I'm happy to take some questions about what I know about it. We could talk about that for a bit. And I've also been using Nginx for about a year, too, on a regular basis. So I've got some pretty good experience with both if you guys want to check it out. And Leo says, hi, or hello. Hi, Leo. Thanks for tuning into the show. But yeah, so... 
you know, that's what I've got here for some simple stuff. I develop on Nginx uh, and do things here locally, certain things. But then when it goes out to a, um, when it goes out to the the actual public, it goes through you know my hosting provider servers. And Leo's uh, phone here, Leo is saying, caught it late. Yeah, uh, this was kind of an impromptu live stream, Leo. Uh, I just thought of this like an hour before I, I did the show. So, you know, I figured it would probably be less people tuning in. But I'm glad that you managed to catch it. You know, there will be a recording of this show that you can check out directly following the broadcast on YouTube. As you know, there's a, as, you, as I'm sure most of you watching YouTube know, there's a replay feature. So this live stream leaving it up, you can check out the replay uh, for anybody that's tuning in late, like Leo, for example. <clears throat> so yeah, again, you know, no worries on that. You know, everybody uh, that's tuning in late, because I do see that the viewership is increasing. Uh, considering I kind of did this unplanned, I kind of expected less people to tune in, but I just kind of wanted to do something, and I felt like, you know what, well, let's do a live stream. I could do a video, but that would be more fun to do a live show, so I chose to do one of those. So, yeah, that's, that's what I was figuring would be fun. And, I mean, again, you know, NGINX is pretty cool, so... You know, I actually had a colleague of mine in the software development world that was kind of like, oh, we should use NGINX for a project, an open source project called Open Broadcaster that we both work on. <clears throat> and uh, full disclosure, I'm also a reseller for Open Broadcaster's products and services and stuff like stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's money being exchanged there. So, I mean, again, not trying to do an ad here, but just so everybody knows full disclosure, there's, you know, some potential conflict of interest in me to saying that, but I, I find the open broadcast stuff interesting anyway. Um, but there was discussions a while back about, Hey, you know, maybe we should put it on NGINX and, you know, I kind of had tangentially used NGINX before those discussions, but it was kind of vaguely just a little bit of use. And I'm like, well, you know, okay, that could be interesting. Long story short, I ended up deciding, you know what, let's try it out. And, uh, you know, everybody together, we all decided, let's try it out. And I started playing with it on my own personally a lot more. And I'm like, yeah, this is pretty powerful stuff. You can do streaming with it, as I've showed. You can do um, all kinds of really cool stuff. So I find that's pretty interesting. You know, Netflix, um, their boxes, I've seen something online. I assume this is true, that their boxes, they put in ISPs networks. They build these servers that host content, basically building their own little mini CDN, if you will, in a way, I guess. And all of these ISP networks, and that system runs from what I heard BSD, I think it's free BSD, and the Nginx web server. And so, uh, you know, for, store, for, for streaming content out over the web. So, again, Nginx is pretty powerful, right? If it's good enough for Netflix, and there's a lot of other big websites that use it from what I've heard as well, uh, for different things, then it's probably not too bad. So I think that it's it's pretty good, and uh, you know, I like I said, I do like it. I have in the past hosted some of my own stuff on Nginx, but it hasn't been like public facing. It's been like internal stuff or internal systems or systems that is for selected members of the public that has got credentials, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, at some point, you know, I, the, the shared hosting I use is dirt cheap, so I just keep using it. Uh, but if, if open source tonight and my other websites get really popular, I'm not going to probably keep it on shared hosting because it's going to become to the point that it's not going to work there. But right now it works there fine. But at that point, I'll probably spin up some servers running Nginx and like a cluster or something in the data center. Or maybe I won't do that. I'll figure out, uh, you know, DigitalOcean has got some interesting static hosting options available where they scale it for you. And you can use things like Hugo, which is what all my sites are really using right now. I use Hugo for my company website. I use it for my personal website at vincentmagger.com. Vincentmagger.dev doesn't currently use it, but I'm not even sure what I'm going to do with that site. I may end up taking it and turning that into just a redirect to vincentmagger.com. I want to keep that domain anyway because I have my one of my main emails that a lot of people reach out to me for for business-related things on that domain. Um, but I don't really know if it makes sense. You know, At one point, I thought about like having a site there that was like a developer kind of blog where I talk about like maybe like computery topics that are more developer centric. So like software development and things like that. I don't know if I really want to do that. I think maybe VincentMaker.com, I could still just put those things there maybe, but I might decide just to put a blog there for like, and, and stuff that's more related to software development. I don't know what you all think. 
Leo says, I build my own server for movies and other things. Yeah, you know, building your own server. I've got a bunch of servers, you know, that are actually just for my own personal use, right? They're not like for the public. So, for example, I've got an Nginx server that I use for development on this Raspberry Pi here. Can't really see it. It's just right out of the frame. Um, but I, I've got a Raspberry Pi 4, 4 gigs of RAM, and I use it for that. I also use it to host my phones. So, you know, phones, right? I've got a phone system... Uh, with asterisk the telephony server i'd actually like to do a video about asterisk the telephony server which is open source and it runs on linux that i think would be a really fun idea to do that as well so for those that don't know what asterisk is i'm happy to enlighten you all but what it basically is in a nutshell we take a look at their website it is a open source they call it an open source framework for building communications yeah, I mean, it is, but really it's it's in my mind, at least for what I use it for, it's a telephony server. And so we can actually look here. You can download it. Um, this has been going on for a long time. They've got FreePBX, which like is like a GUI that basically configures FreePB, uh, FreePBX, basically a GUI that configures Asterisk. But some of us, and I mean me, myself, and I, by the way, let me just exit out here and I'll SSH into my Pi and I'll show you this. So there is my Raspberry Pi, and then I will show you. So I've got asterisk right here. Well, I told you, folks. I tell you, I got to get a light to where I can see my keyboard better because my monitor is so big now, it covers half of it. It's, it's annoying. But this is the system, and if I reload, I hope I didn't store anything sensitive there in that reload. Probably shouldn't have done it. But anyway, I've got some cool stuff that I can do. Um, you know, like, for example, you can, if you look at asterisk well, here this is a production server i use for stuff so it's got passwords and stuff i don't want to show but like my hosting provider here i've got a config file for my sip trunk with them and i literally just have that file included in the pjsip.conf file right here so i used to manage just so everybody understands uh a free pbx years ago is my home phone system and i've got asterisk my home phone system these days even though lately it's been on a commission and i've just been writing calls straight to a phone but i need to get that system back up and running it's running a really old version of asterisk and so i need to get that fixed but anyway um i i've gotten pretty familiar with asterisk at this point right and at this point i can really go in there and just edit the configs and get what i need and so for like a raspberry pi instance i find that's a lot more lighter weight and it allows me to customize really good free pbx they give you like custom versions of most of these files like pjsip dot uh, or pjsip underscore custom dot com for example or extensions underscore custom dot com extensions just so you know what that is is that basically is the whole dial plan of everything that can be dialed on the phone system so for example this phone has it since 6004 so 6004 is a entry in there so if you dial it <clears throat> what happens well it rings that phone for so many seconds and then it could say go to voicemail if the that, that person doesn't answer the line but um as far as like my cisco phone that actually is using sccp right now which is the phone i just picked up there and that's the config file for it again i can't show a lot of this stuff for security reasons but maybe i should spin up a clean asterisk and demo it but um <clears throat> you can do some pretty cool stuff you know like we've got this manager stuff right here manager.conf that is a really oh i wasn't showing the screen i'm sorry but um manager.conf is really cool because you can actually programmably make calls and stuff with it so like for example i built an application where when an alert happens a weather alert it can make an automated page on the phone system through the phone speakers and such and that is that's pretty cool that you can do that so you know that's pretty cool uh, in addition to that we've also got like cdr so you can detail your you know your call records you can put them in things like my sequel and um postgres as well and things like that so it's pretty cool i've experimented with a lot of these different things over the years music on hold.com let's look at that that's one of the few ones i can show you because it's not going to be really <clears throat> you know there's really nothing in the music hold configuration that's private to the system like no passwords or anything is in this no secret credentials so if we look at this you can actually see here i have got my directory music on hold and in here i've just got some i think it is ulaw files which is a common phone system format but we can set up here and have everything work 
You can do announcements. I didn't mean to open DaVinci Resolve. Um, <laughs> give me a second here. That might show some projects here. Oh, no, it doesn't. It literally just shows the New Year's live show. All right. But anyway, um, regardless, you can go in here and you can customize to def your music on hold. So I can do sort random, which I believe is the default, uh, which is commented out. You can do your announcement at the beginning of it. So if you want to say, please remain on the line. <clears throat> you know, um, I think it's pretty cool. So, you know, there's there's some interesting customization that you have available. Um, they can press this button and it will switch to listen to this music on hold class. So that one's pretty cool. If you've ever called a company before, Astros can do this where you, you might hear, um, if you would prefer to listen to silence during this call, let's say, you can make a music on hold class that's silence. And then if they press, say, one or pound or whatever it is that use up for the digits, then it can switch to that automatically. Or you might even have, I've heard some that you call, and it's like, if you want classic rock, press one. If you want Christian music, press two. If you want top 40 music, press three. And then it can selectively switch to the, the audio <clears throat> mix that, you know, you want them to hear. So, yeah, I mean, like, again, all the configuration is pretty simple here. And so we can very easily configure a simple phone system with a little bit of technical know-how. And it's all open standards, all open source. It's really cool. Yeah, but anyway, what can I say? I think it is pretty cool. As a telecom guy, I, I personally really like telecom for over 10 years. Astros is pretty cool. So... I don't know what y'all think in the chat. Do y'all think I should do an open source tonight episode on Asterisk? I think that would be really cool. Maybe even like a full podcast episode specifically. But I'd say at least like a YouTube video or two about it. What do y'all think? Just let me know what you think in the chat. <clears throat> but yeah, I think that that would be pretty fun. I think that would be pretty fun. And my voice is getting tired. So as a programming note, I'm probably going to end the live show here at about uh, the one hour mark. And we're at about 42 minutes, 41 minutes and something seconds in. But I mean, again, you can customize this entire thing to your heart's content. Uh, you can actually have it output to also a call. So for example... You could actually make it to where somebody could dial into Ulsa. I've done this before. And you could have it to where that when they pick up the phone and dial this, it could say auto answer and it could go out to a PA system. So that is something that you could do if, say, you had a business and you wanted to output, say, the output of the phone system where you could do a page. So, you know, like, for example, you might have, hey, Bob, you got a call on line three. Bob, line three, please. You know, you just dial a, a code into the phone, right? And you can make a page uh, all over the PA system, the loudspeaker system, whatever you want to call it, um, in the building. And so that's something that you could use that for. Um, so I find that kind of interesting. I used to do that with my phone system. I had, um, this was over a year or two ago now, but I used to have some speakers set up in my office and I had my phone system uh, where it would route a uh, extension with also like I was just showing there, to an audio jack and then that audio jack would go into an amplifier and then that fed those speakers in that room there was a couple because it was a relatively big room it was the basement back then when i used to be in the basement for a long time viewers you'll recognize that because i'm up in my shed studio space that's you know better uh, environment now but regardless like i had some speakers down there and i could page them or for example somebody else could actually pick up a phone if they needed me and make an announcement another thing i did was i had a thing called park and page that's what nortel always called it um and i like nortel stuff so i'm using some of the Nor nortel terminology <clears throat> But basically what Astros calls is park and announce. It's basically the same concept where the call will get parked and then it can make an automated PA announcement that sounds something like bakery and deli. You have a call parked on seven zero one. And then you could go to any phone in the building, dial 701, and magic, you have your phone call. So that's really good for people in a business, maybe, for example, where they're walking around or something, and you don't know what phone they're going to be at. You could just do a parking page, or again, Astros calls it a parking announce, to handle their, their call when that they dial in through, say, an auto attendant, uh, IVR kind of interface, etc. And so, you know, that's really handy. And I, I noticed that this is something that a lot of places don't do but i think it's a great idea we have a local um 
grocery store here called Food City, and they actually do that. They uh, Well, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to do it when they had a Nortel system. They used to have park and page set up. So if you dialed, for example, the bakery and deli was one option, it would make a page. And that makes sense because the bakery and deli is kind of big in our Food City, and I'm, there's several phones. And my guess is they did that because there may be people that are you know working for the bakery and deli that's a little bit all over the place. They've got seating for people to eat, they've got you know all this stuff. So it gives them you know whatever phone that they're nearest, they can just dial it uh, and you know really quickly get that call. So I think that's pretty cool that that's possible that you can do it that way. Um. But yeah, I think I'm probably going to end the show here. I wanted to end it at the hour mark, but I tell you, I am about out of breath. Usually I can talk for a really long time, but today I'm a little tired. So, you know, today's probably not the best day to do a long form show. But I hope you all enjoyed the live stream. Again, it will be left up. So if you all want to check it out after the fact, you all are welcome to do that. But anyway, I thank you very much for watching today's live broadcast, everybody. Thanks for watching Open Source Tonight. This is Vincent signing off. Goodbye, everybody.